One area of interest that uh, we want to take a look at <clears throat> is how much power each of these uh, individual displays draw during operation. Uh, and we can do that in, depending on the uh, specific settings that each manufacturer builds into their device. A couple of different ways, both for two displays on or a single display on, as well as for the uh, high and low brightness, and in certain cases in different refresh rate modes that a manufacturer provides to the user. The way we can do that is by getting a probe for the current uh, as it passes through the actual uh, device connecting cable. Uh, unfortunately, if we were to use just the device cable as is, uh, we have a shielded braid around the actual cabling. So what we'll need to do is first cut in to the cabling a little bit, as you see here, and get to the power uh, wire, this thick red wire inside of each of these cables. And so now with our non-contact probe, we'll be able to measure the current flowing through this uh, at an assumed five volts uh, output from your device. Again, the voltage may change, uh, but with a constant voltage from every device, we can get a rough understanding of the power difference with one setting versus another. So how we would do that is we take our non-contact probe here, turn it on, and we're going to be measuring DC amperage here. So you'll see that for DC amperage, if we get the probe around as such, with our device off again, as expected, we are seeing zero amps through our probe. But as we plug in our headset, you'll see that as the displays turn on, we'll also get a corresponding increase in the amperage that's flowing uh, to this device. So at around five volts, this is around 2.2, 2.3 watts that we're drawing for a fully on white display. Now we can also modulate the brightness and decrease the brightness as you see here. This device pulls uh, about 1.4 watts um, at a five volt terminal. Uh, and then again, back to, uh, if we turn off the device completely, you'll see that we do have a baseline of about one watt power draw. And this will be again for uh, all of the power that the microcontroller draws, as well as all the other ancillary functions that may function through this pair of headset, like the audio uh, without the displays on. But we can turn the device back on and the brightness at max. Now that we've torn down three separate display headsets, uh, we can actually compare the power draw across all three of these. So here we show X Reels Air 1s in blue, Radio's Air 3s's in green, and the Chur Pro XR glasses in gray. When we have the displays off uh, with the glasses plugged in uh, to a laptop or a phone, all of these devices draw about one watt, no real appreciable difference between the two of them. But as we start turning on the displays, uh, we do see that there is slight difference, uh, primarily at low brightness. All of these devices were tested at 120 hertz, and low brightness, their lowest, while high brightness, their highest brightness setting. For Ray Neo, it's really the only one that shows a roughly 33% increase in the power draw uh, relative to its competitors uh, at the lowest brightness setting. I think when we look at the spectrum a little bit later, we'll see exactly why that is. Uh, but at high brightness, uh, we, we don't really see much difference here. Uh, and we get the um, 2.5 watt power consumption kind of across all three of these devices. What's interesting to take a look at is uh, the performance of the displays, um, either at the different refresh rates that they're capable of, and so on the left side, we have Radio Air 3s, um, which do operate at either 60 or 120 hertz. Um, while technically functionality for this can be enabled for all of them, only Radio allows this for native uh, user interface. And you see that uh, while there's a small uh, decrease uh, between 120 and 60 hertz, 
it's not an unreasonable amount, uh, about 20% lower power consumption when we go from the 120 hertz modes, whether it's low or high brightness, down to the 60 hertz modes uh, in the dashed black lines. We can also cycle through multiple different uh, primary colors of the device. This will, of course, drive specific subpixels of the display. So here we're only driving all of the blue subpixels. Here are all of the green subpixels, and here are all of the red subpixels. And again, if we go back up to white, where we're driving every single one of these pixels, you can see the, the significant increase in uh, current drawn in our device. If we take a look at Xreal Air's power consumption by primary color, um, we can actually see a really interesting trend. Uh, obviously, still the one watt power draw uh, off, uh, about two and a half watts on. Uh, but when we only emit the primary blue, green, and red subpixels, uh, we see that really the biggest power consumption comes from your blue subpixels. Um, this can be for a variety of factors, whether it's a, a higher voltage required uh, for this subpixel or um, a uh, lower light efficiency per input amperage. Uh, the blue subpixels tend to be the least energy efficient followed by green and followed by red. But this is a very nice way to take a look at how much power we're drawing while we're using this device and estimate roughly how much battery life uh, we'll be consuming with our device. Another interesting thing we can do with our device is start me measuring the spectral output of our device. What we wanna do is take a spectrophotometer like the one that you see here which will ultimately uh, be able to collect the light output that's coming from any particular source in this uh, sensing location and give us an insight into what that output looks like, both in terms of strength versus wavelength, uh, as well as overall um, luminance uh, of the device. So here, uh, an interesting thing we can take a look at is for a white fully white source, which is going to give us all three primary emitters, red, green, and blue from the uh, OLED micro display panel. We can take this and we can start measuring and what we see here is essentially that the uh, light output from the panel is around a thousand lux. Um, again, we don't have a direct brightness of the display, the nits with this particular photo uh, diode. But what we're really interested in is this particular spectrum that we see here. Uh, and what we can see here is that the blue, the green, and the red are not very well split peaks. So this will give us uh, a little bit more information about the specific type of OLED micro display, or even if it's LCD or micro LED, what kind of quality, picture quality, we can expect from each of these displays based off of how pure these separate wavelengths uh, can separate from one another. This is essentially the color space that is producible by each of these displays. And the more distinct the blue, green, and red peaks are, the easier it will be to recreate a wider variety of colors. Again, we'll compare all three device types, the Vitur, the X-Reels, and the Ray Neos uh, for their uh, color spectrum output. Um, here we look at the Vitur white, uh, pure white spectrum, and it's very similar to the X-Reels that we just measured. Uh, and we can put them in contrast with the Ray Neo uh, white output. And already we can see how much more pure the Ray Neo blue, green, and red uh, spectral output is compared to the Vitur and also uh, the uh, X-Reels. So putting them side by side, uh, on the left we have Rainio versus Vitur, um, and on the right we have Vitur versus X-Reel. Uh, you can very clearly see Vitur and X-Reel because of the Sony panel that they use have a very similar output. And this leads me to believe that Sony's OLED emitters um, are not exactly the purest. They may not be using the most late, latest generation uh, OLED emitting materials. 
and that's why we have such an overlap, especially in the blue and green area, leading to an overall uh, smaller color space that they can use, uh, typically maybe in the order of 90-95% sRGB, um, but definitely nowhere close to 100 DCI-P3. But on the left, Rayneo, uh, rightfully so, advertises a much better color space because of these distinct blue, green, and red peaks that we see in the light gray. Uh, so we'll dig in a little bit more into that shortly. We can also, instead of uh, looking at all of the white color that's coming out of the display, individually measure just, in this case, blue. We'll put the blue on uh, the screen and take the data collection. And we can see we get a very, very nice pure blue, uh, peaking around 450 nanometers, uh, with a very relatively narrow full width half max. We can do the same with green, which is a little bit less pure. And I think this is where the Sony panels do struggle. Um, the green OLED emitter does not give us a very nice uh, monospectral output uh, in the green band, despite having a peak of around 520, uh, we have a very broad, broad uh, green shoulder, especially in the blue, and quite a bit of output at the 630 uh, side. And then finally, we can go to pure red, where again, Sony, I think, does a decent job, a 630 nanometer peak, um, but a slightly larger full width half max than blue here. And each panel will have different outputs um, possible based off of the specific OLED material that their device uses. Uh, but we'll take a look at all of these OLED micro displays in comparison to one another. We start with the white spectrum that we get from Xreal, or in this case, Vitur, both using the same Sony panels. We can break that down into the individual subcomponents, like the blue that we measured, uh, where we overlap just the first peak uh, in this tri-peak white region, add in the green, and then finally the red, uh, all relatively normalized to one another so that we can see the, the general shape of the spectral output of each of the red, green, and blue subpixels. And this is where we could start comparing different panels like the ones from uh, Vitur or from Ray Neo. On the left, we have Vitur's uh, Sony micro display, similar to the X Reels, where we have very wide um, emitter peaks versus the Ray Neo SIA panels uh, that have much narrower peaks. For spectral outputs, we use a measure known as full width half max or FWHM. You can see for Vitures Sony panels, we have about 40 nanometers FWHM uh, in blue, 62 nanometers in green, and about 50 nanometers in red all relatively wide and much, much wider than the um, uh, likely SIA panel we see on the right, which is a 20 nanometer full width half max for blue, 31 in green and 35 in red. So uh, this tells me that um, whatever panel uh, technology and whatever emitter technology that they're using on the right, we have much more improved OLED emission materials uh, than the ones on the left which ultimately gives a much richer color space uh, and a more vibrant display that you see when these glasses are on your head. But we'll take a look at all of these OLED micro displays in comparison to one another. And uh, more importantly, we can take a look both at the uh, display by itself with all of the optical films removed, as well as the display as it goes through the optical elements. Now, we don't expect many changes for the color accuracy of the display as it goes through the optical elements. But what does change is the total light output. So to give an example, we'll take a look at a white light source that's coming out of uh, the OLED micro display panel. It gives us around 850 to 900 lux. But as soon as we use that white light source through the uh, folded optical path of our bird bath lenses, you see that we are going to have a significant reduction in the total light output, uh, around one eighth of the total light delivered to the eye, uh, about 120 lux. 
And so this is because we're wasting a lot of light. Even in this video, you can see coming out of the half mirror, uh, being lost to various polarization uh, changes along the way. And what this ultimately means is that we have to have a much brighter starting display to give a very, very good um, high brightness image delivered to the user. So these types of measurements from now on, we'll take a look at each of the headsets that we tear down uh, and we'll put them in comparison with one another so that we have a good understanding of the pros and cons of each of the chosen micro displays and where uh, specific suppliers for each of these big brands are actually improving, uh, like we saw with the Ray Neo uh, improved spectral uh, output of the OLED micro display. Uh, that particular panel from SIA is actually a much, much purer quality um, OLED micro display than we see here out of these uh, Sony, maybe first generation uh, devices. So thanks again for watching this video. Uh, and if you've got any questions or comments, leave them down below.